Hi, thanks so much for joining us this week for the Pitt Theology Library weekly webinar workshop. I'm Elizabeth Miller, the Reserves and Circulation Specialist at Pitts, and today we're going to be talking about decoding the news, doing and teaching news literacy, a very hot topic right now. So to get started, we're going to take a look at the plan for today. So going to start out by introducing myself because I am not someone who normally does these workshops, um, just so everyone knows who I am. Then we'll go on to looking at what news literacy really is, distinguishing between misinformation and disinformation. Um, then we were going to narrow our focus onto types of misinformation, look at some tools for verification or debunking of content, and then at the end, I will leave you with some more resources to do some learning on your own. So to get started, I'm, as I said, Elizabeth Miller, the Reserves and Circulation Specialist. Um, but in a past life, I also worked as an intern on what's called the Human Rights Channel at Witness. Um, Witness is a human rights video advocacy organization based in Brooklyn, New York. And the Human Rights Channel was a YouTube channel that found and verified and promoted citizen footage of human rights abuses. So as part of our job, we learned a lot about verifying video and ensuring that the content that we were promoting was actually true and verifiable. So my experiences there really shaped my interest in this and a lot of the content you're going to see today. Um, after that, I was a communication and governmental affairs intern at the Solidarity Center in Washington, D.C., um, which is a human, <clears throat> excuse me, international workers' rights organization affiliated with the AFL-CIO. And at both of these internships, I was so blessed to be able to work with really experienced, passionate journalists and they all continue to do advocacy work in the field um, and taught me so much about journalism and ethics and uh, news literacy. Beyond that, my research interests are in social informatics and the relationship between religion, technology, and society at which news literacy is the intersection. <laughs> so that is me and my background and how I know these things. So I also would like to note that um, a lot of this information comes from John Silva at the News Literacy Project and his presentation on a very similar topic at the November 2020 Newslet Camp, um, which is a great experience and I'll talk more about later, but need to give credit where credit is due. So let's get started. So what is news literacy? News literacy is being able to determine the credibility of information. So being able to go online, find, come across an article someone shared and be able to go, hmm, okay, that is something I trust or something I don't trust, or that is something that is patently false. To do that, you kind of have to understand the standards of authoritative fact-based journalism um, there are a ton of different codes of ethics that circulate through the journalism world, um, but there are five things that you can kind of distill out of all of them. Um, and these five mostly come from the Ethical Journalism Network and SPJ, the Society of Professional Journalists. As a journalist, you should seek truth and accuracy as much as possible. Independence. So you're not writing on behalf of special interests, whether that be political or commercial. You're writing in a balanced way, showing multiple sides of the story. You minimize harm to the communities that you are writing about. And you remain accountable and transparent and explain your ethical choices. And then finally, being news literate allows you to interact with the news and promote your engagement in civic life and really figuring out what you want to act upon and what 
you really care about. So misinformation and disinformation mostly differ based on the motivation. Misinformation is false or misleading information that is created and or shared regardless of intent to deceive. Whereas disinformation is the same thing that is knowingly and intentionally created or shared in order to deceive. Trying to look into different motivations for creating disinformation and trying to analyze those motivations would be a whole other webinar, but um, it's an important thing to consider and especially knowing that it is very frequently not clear what the motivation behind something is. But sometimes it's a little bit easier when you consider the types of misinformation, which we have here. So the first is manipulated content, which is when you change the actual material. So if you're Photoshopping pictures, or if you're looking at a deep fake video, um, with the technology to make someone look like they're speaking, but they're not actually saying those things. Um, that's manipulated content. False context is extremely common and also really hard to spot a lot of the time because false context is real content that's just been taken out of its original context. Um, and we will look at that in just a minute. Fabricated content is just entirely made up with the intent of having people believe it. Um, these are often very exaggerated claims um, with a lot of emotional grasp to make people really react and remember it. Imposter content is also sometimes hard to spot because it uses a well-known name or brand, but it changes the content. For example, like a, a fake tweet. Um, you often see screenshots of tweets circulating around the internet. It's very easy to have a screenshot like that and just replace the text with whatever you want it to say while it still looks like it comes from a reputable source. Um, and then finally, satire. There's nothing wrong with satire um, as long as you know that it's satire, and that's where the problem lies. Sometimes satire gets mistaken as real, um, and that can start lots of confusion throughout groups of people. So for an example of false context, there's this example I got from the News Literacy Project's uh, website, and it shows the top photo is a Facebook post that claims that tanks are appearing in downtown Toronto during the stay-at-home order in April 2020. So there are a couple of things that you can look at when you're, when you're trying to figure out what this is. So it's a real photo, but it was posted by the Canadian, Canadian Armed Forces Operations on Twitter on October 1st, 2016. So the actual event that they were there for was an all night arts event um, and it has nothing to do with the stay at home order in April, 2020 and was four years earlier, in fact. So another thing that's true about this claim, though, is that citizens were told to expect to see more military vehicles in 20, April 2020, as those vehicles were relocated to a nearby base. So you can see how these aspects of truth can be twisted into a false an ultimately false story um, to presumably to hype people up. So the bottom image there shows 
something that we won't get a lot of time to talk about today, but a tactic that you can use to um, verify images like this is you can actually go onto Google Street View in Google Maps and they were able to verify that this image came from 2016 by matching the advertisement in the background, um, which is a very clever way of matching things to verify the context. So we'll talk a little bit of, a little bit more about that later, but um, for now, just something really cool to know and keep in mind for when you're trying to verify something that you've heard. So to verify information that you find online, there are three, three basic techniques, critical observation, reverse image search, and lateral reading. So we're gonna start with critical observation and here we have two images that are both claiming to be of the MAGA March on Washington in November, 2020. So at a first glance, could be um, both pictures of big crowds. There's lots of colors happening, lots of people. Um, but when you start to look a little bit closer, you can see some important differences between the photos. So you can't really see buildings that are the same in the two photos. Um, there's clearly not a big glass building in the one on the left and similar vice versa. Um, in the top right corner of the picture on the right, there is this sort of squat building with filled with people on top of the roof. Um, and you can't see that anywhere in the left image either, which seems odd. Um, the trees in the left photo look to be in the fall probably. They look a little bit dead. Um, maybe the leaves are falling, maybe it's colder. But in the right photo, the trees are lush. So maybe closer to spring or summer. And then finally, on the left image, you see a lot of blue and red throughout the crowd um, in their clothes, flags, um, banners, that kind of thing. But in the image on the right, you see a lot more yellow. Um, there is yellow in the one on the left, but there's a lot more yellow in the one on the right. Um, I'm not going to tell you just yet which image is from the mag march and which is not. Um, we're going to look at some critical observation techniques first and then use reverse image search to actually see uh, which one is real. So when you're doing critical observation, you want to consider the things like what I was looking at in the two images. You can look for architecture and landscape. Um, do you spot any distinctive buildings that are very clearly part of one city or another? Um, if they're in DC, is the Capitol in the picture? Is the White House in the picture? Is Lincoln Memorial? Things like that. Does the area look like the area it claims to be? Um, maybe you don't know anything about, I don't know, Houston, Texas. Um, you can hop onto Google Maps Street View and pop around the city and see if the area is looks the same as it does in whatever image you're looking at. Also, you can look for visible text. So street names, business signs, advertisements like they showed in the Canadian military example. Um, license plates might give you a hint of what geographic region you're in. All these things you can use and then search online and see if 
Joe's Bagels on 2nd Street is really in the area that it claims to be in, in this picture. Um, weather is kind of a sneaky one that you can look at. Is it consistent across the images that are claiming to be of the same event? Was there rain that day? Was it cloudy? Are there any reflections of things or shadows? Any distinctive plants or trees? Um, like we looked at in the previous slide, the trees in the photo on the left look to be more dead and fall-like, but the ones in the right were lush and green and looked a lot more like spring or summer plant life. Um, evidence of photo manipulation, it's a bit harder to see, especially if you're working with an unclear photo to begin with. But you can keep an eye out for pixelation, um, halos around edges or certain, um, certain elements could mean that something's been photoshopped in and you've blurred around the edges of it. Color distortions and cloned elements. Um, this didn't happen in either of the previous pictures, but you could create crowds using Photoshop um, by replicating different segments of people and make it look like a much bigger crowd than it is. And then finally, metadata, um, which is data about data. So is there a copyright stamp on the picture anywhere or a timestamp? Can you download it and see when the picture was taken? Or is there an attribution anywhere for the photographer? Um, these are all things that you can use to look at images and see, see if they are what they're purporting to be. But if this doesn't get you all the way there, something you can try is a reverse image search. So a reverse image search is a specialized type of search that matches pixel patterns in images. So when you get the results, they'll show matching images, but then also similar images that have a similar color breakdown, um, composition, that kind of thing. To do a reverse image search, you can do it directly in your browser, um, particularly if you use Google Chrome, you can right click on an image and it will show up as an option to search image on Google. Um, you can link to the URL of the image or upload a file using a couple of different tools um, that I will show you shortly. And there are also a couple mobile apps available if you're doing verification on the go. So for those last two photos, I, in this example here, search, did a reverse image search of the photo on the right, the one with the yellow and the lush trees. So Google actually filled in for me the Cleveland Cavaliers parade. So um, when you do a reverse image search, it shows you what you've input, which is the first result, um, and then follows with things about that event. Um, so you can see it's been three years since the Caps Championship, Cleveland Cavaliers Championship Parade. And then it shows you visually similar images. Um, and most of those are from also the Cleveland Cavaliers Parade in 2016. So you're not always gonna have a search quite as reliable as this or as obvious. Um, but in my experience, I've had really good luck finding original source material by doing this. And at the end of the search, they show you pages that have that image in the page. So this is a great example. 
because the first article is about the championship itself. But then the second one, that very last thing, is actually an article by a fact-checking organization. So fact-checking organizations are a bit complicated, um, but PolitiFact is one of the ones that um, I and many others find very trustworthy and it comes highly recommended by the News Literacy Project. And if you wanted to know more about this picture, that would be a great place to start. Um, they show their work through the whole process of trying to um, fact check the image being shown. And um, you can learn a lot about verification, but also how this process begins. So these are the aforementioned reverse image search tools. Um, Domain Tools is a security firm, um, but they created this chart that looks at the things that four of the major reverse image search tools do well and not so well. So the, <laughs> the best one, debatably, is actually Bing. Um, but people use all of them. A lot of people use Google just for its convenience. TinEye is one of the older ones, um, but still does a great job. So if you're looking for a reverse image search tool, Google, Yandex, Bing, and TinEye are a great place to start, particularly if you're looking for a certain thing. Um, like you can see, Yandex is the best at finding faces, um, but if that's not what you're looking for, there are other options as well. So finally, we have lateral reading, which is probably something you already do. So lateral reading is when you verify what you read while you're reading it. So if you have a story on Facebook open, pop open another tab and do some searches to make sure that what you're reading is really what you think you're reading. When you do lateral reading, you'll be verifying your key details, the credibility of your source, and trying to learn more context about the article or image or video that you're watching, which we saw before is extremely important because falsifying the context is probably one of the simplest ways to spread misinformation. Um, I also want to note that lateral reading is not my terminology. It comes from research done by Sam Weinberg and Sarah McGrew at the Stanford Graduate School of Education. So to do lateral reading, um, you'll want to use effective search strategies and tools. So some ways to get a better search result is to enter your search as a question. So you want to do that because fact-checking articles often are titled in the form of a question. So when you're doing a search and you phrase it as a question, you'll be more likely to come up with results from fact-checking sources, um, which are a great way to have someone else do the research for you and save yourself a lot of time. Um, if there are any key phrases in the article or in the image or video, put those in quotations to make sure that you're specifying your search to exactly what they're talking about. Um, be sure to check your spelling, which seems intuitive, but um, it's really easy to spread 
misinformation by having the wrong spelling of someone's name or location or um, things like that. And then finally, be specific and detailed with your searches. Um, there'll likely be a lot of information out there about whatever it is that you're looking for. So try to narrow it down as much as you possibly can to the exact thing that you're talking about. Um, maybe you have a year that you can specify, a date, a location, um, a person, a an organized event that's nearby or happening. Things like that can help you narrow down what it is that you're looking for. Um, once you have searched, you want to review the results really carefully and look and see, are there multiple sources saying the same thing? The more sources there are that say the same thing, the more likely it is to be on the accurate side. Um, that being said, you do want to make sure that said sources seem relevant and reliable. Um, there are many, many websites devoted specifically to disinformation. Um, the motivations of which, again, would be a whole other <laughs> webinar, but worth considering that there are people out there who are just creating content to mislead. Um, so keep an eye out for stuff like that when you're looking through these sources. Um, a relevant and reliable news source might be a news network that you've heard of. Um, it might be a local newspaper or television outlet, something like that. Once you find some things to look at, evaluate the information inside the sources. Um, so you'll want to do pretty much the same thing that you've been doing this whole time with those as well to make sure that what you're finding is the same across the sources. And then finally, keep searching until you're confident. So if you find two more articles that say the same thing and you're still not sure, it seems a little bit sketchy, you haven't heard of these news sources that you're finding information from, keep searching um, until you find something or someone saying, saying a thing that you're confident in. Um, you don't have to believe everything that's out there. There's a lot of untrue things floating around. So you are more than entitled to be skeptical and just keep searching until you find that either something is true or it isn't. So here I would like to wrap up with some more resources for further learning um, because these webinars are very short and there is a lot um, about news literacy and media literacy, and web literacy going on around the world right now. Um, these are some of my favorite sources. Um, as I mentioned, the News Literacy Project is a fabulous source for training and information. And also, if you want to teach someone else about news literacy, there are countless, countless resources from the News Literacy Project. They have a specific online tool called Checkology, which is an online learning platform and goes through different types of misinformation, how to spot it, how to be an advocate for spreading truth. Um, they also offer some information on what I think is exceptionally important, um, debunking things in a way that won't start a fight, um, delicately challenging someone, um, and being willing to step away when people would like to fight about things. So 
they have a ton going on. They also have an event that I attended called Newslet Camp, where they partner with a, um, a journalistic organization. So the one that I went to was with the Texas Tribune, but they've also done ones with NPR and um, CNN Worldwide and other news agencies. And it's a full day professional development opportunity where you learn all about this kind of stuff and also how to teach it and other resources. Um, first draft is aimed a bit more toward professional journalists, but they have a ton of training videos and um, documents and web pages that, and video, a lot of video um, that can help you learn some more tools for verification. Newseum Ed is the product of the former Newseum, um, which was a museum in Washington, D.C. that promoted news history education as well as news literacy education. And since they've had to close their physical doors, they've started an online platform called Newseum Ed, where they teach a lot of similar things to the News Literacy Project, um, just in a different format with different sponsors. Um, so you'll hear some different things between these first three. Um, number four, I've listed a couple fact-checking organizations that are known to be reliable um, from the general journalistic community. So if you find something from Snopes or factcheck.org or PolitiFact, you're probably gonna see good information where they have shown their work and shown their process of how they have checked these facts um, and come to their conclusions. And that's the kind of thing that you wanna see to evaluate a fact-checking source. Um, there's a lot more information about that out there too. So if you would like more information, there's certainly plenty. Um, finally, you can always ask your friendly neighborhood librarians, um, whether that be us here at Pitts or your local public librarian. Um, always happy to help and try to verify information with you. So to wrap up, um, I have some contact information here for myself. Um, you can reach me by email at Pitts. Um, I am more than happy to work with you on verification or send more resources for places to learn or contact information of people in the field who do this work. So please feel free to reach out for anything like that. Um, if you have general questions, you can always reach out to the Pitts Reference Desk at pitts.mra.edu slash ask. And for more weekly workshop content, visit us at pitts.mra.edu slash www. So thanks so much for joining us today. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact us um, with at any of these options below.